Hello everyone, it's Hunter and welcome back to my channel. If you guys are new here, it is so nice to meet you. In today's video, I'm going to be taking you guys through the steps of making a YouTube video, or at least what I do. So start to finish from the idea all the way up until you watch it on YouTube. So this video is also a collaboration with a bunch of other girls here on YouTube. I will put all of their channels on the screen for you and they'll all be linked down below. They're all making similar videos and I think that it'll be interesting for you guys to see the differences in equipment and editing software and setups that everyone has because we are all at different points in our YouTube journeys. Some have just started out, some have been doing it for a long time like I have, and others are kind of somewhere in the middle, and some just whatever. So we all have different setups and so I think it will be interesting to see the differences between everyone. So that's kind of what's happening today. Um, be sure to check out all of their channels. Like I said, they will be linked in the description box down below. We are all posting our videos on this day, the day that this video goes live, but we are posting them at different times just because we do all have different schedules. So if you don't see their video like this, be sure to check back on their channel because it will be up later. And if you do not see the video, then be sure to check out other videos on their channel. So now let me go ahead and just tell you what's going to happen in this video so that we can kind of start with a framework. First, I want to give a disclaimer that first, this video is purely what I do and whatever I'm doing is not the right or wrong way to do something. So if you make a YouTube video differently and you're just curious, just keep in mind is just how I do it and you don't have to do it this way if you don't want to or if you don't have the money for some equipment that I have or things like that. Also, this is going to be a pretty brief overview of stuff because I do have a couple of in-depth videos on my channel about my equipment, about how I make my thumbnails and how to brainstorm video ideas. So just keep in mind that if I am speeding through something pretty quickly, it's because I have another video on my channel about it, which I will also link in the description box if you would like more information. So now let's go ahead and discuss the topics. First, I right, we're going to talk about planning and my filming setup, my equipment, editing, thumbnails, and uploading. So first, we're going to talk about planning. I think planning is the first step in anything that you do. And I do think that planning is probably one of the most important steps. So I have some notes on my phone. So I'm just going to go ahead and read these off for you. But planning helps me to know when to film a video and it gives me an outline of what I'm talking about. This video right that I'm filming now did require a lot more planning going into it just because I do have so much information and I want to make sure my thoughts are gathered. But for vlogs, those are less planned out and videos like my monthly favorites videos. Those are just things that I kind of curate throughout the month. Same thing with my reading videos, things like that. But videos like this where I'm sitting down and talking to you more in depth and giving you more valuable information rather than just entertainment do require a bit more planning. But that's because I want to make sure that I'm giving you information that's concise and helpful without being too overwhelming. So next we're going to talk about my filming setup. Like I said, I do have an in-depth video on my channel about all of my equipment and everything that I use for my YouTube channel, but I just want to talk about my filming setup real quick. So this is just a brief overview of what I use for all of the videos that I make. For the most part, I use a Sony a6400. It is an incredible camera. It is a bit of an investment. It was just under a thousand dollars. After tax it was over a thousand dollars. So it is a really big investment but it's incredible quality and I do have a review on my channel if you want more information about the camera. But all I can say is that I 100% recommend having a camera like this one because it makes the quality so good. But if you don't have it it's not the end of the world. And then on occasion I will use my Canon G7X which I used for years but just felt like I needed to upgrade. I used that one for years and it was great. But like I said, I needed an upgrade. So on occasion, I will use that camera for B-roll or behind the scenes if I'm using my Sony to film something as like a main video. And then I use that as like a behind the scenes secondary camera. And I also use my iPhone 11 Pro Max sometimes for video clips. There is a weird thing going on with my camera right now. I don't know what's wrong. And I think it's probably like within the camera and it can't be fixed. I either have like a speck of dust or there's a dead pixel inside of the camera lens itself. And I don't know how to fix it. So no idea what's going on. It basically has like this dark spot on the screen and it's driving me crazy. So I haven't been using my phone for as much stuff whenever I'm filming videos. But if I'm out and about and I'm vlogging for the day and I don't want to take my camera inside of a store, it's super obvious. Or if I'm just getting some basic B-roll in a store, it's just a little bit easier to pull my phone out than it is my camera sometimes. In addition to that, I also use a tripod. I have the specific tripod written in or in that video where I talked about my equipment, but the brand is Sunpack. Uh, that's pretty much all I can tell you about it. It has a rotating head so it makes it easier to film videos at different angles and it's pretty sturdy. I paid like 50 bucks for it from Best Buy. I think a tripod is 100% worth it because then you can film wherever you want to without having to worry about having a surface to put your camera on and I also prefer 64 gigabyte SanDisk SD cards just because they film, they hold more content, they hold 
longer videos and bigger video files. Bigger is usually better when it comes to an SD card. 64 is typically more affordable than 128 and I just switched back and forth between two different 64 gigabyte cards. So that is my filming setup as far as equipment goes. In terms of where I'm going to be filming, I kind of just decide on a whim. Right now I decided that my bed was made, my room's clean, the light's good in here right now, so I decided to film in here. But sometimes I film in my office or my living room. It really just depends on what I'm talking about. This video probably would have been better in my office because that's where I have all of my tech stuff, but I like the way this background looked about better. But if I am talking about my favorites, sometimes that's more vlog style, um, and I just hold the camera. I also use a smaller tripod whenever I'm vlogging around my house just so that I can set it on different surfaces pretty quickly without having to remove the camera from the big tripod constantly. And sometimes I film in my bedroom because I think it looks nice. If I'm talking about home decor or cooking or something, I'll be in my living room or my kitchen. So it really just depends, and I think that's a good thing for you to plan into your video because the lighting can be different in different rooms of your house based on what time of day you're filming. For example, if it was earlier in the day, I probably would have filmed in my office, but there's like a reflection on the building beside my house that's like coming into the window right now, which is giving me incredible light. So that's kind of how you kind of have to plan on as far as like your atmosphere. So next we're gonna move on to editing equipment. I edit on a MacBook Pro from 2019 and I use Final Cut Pro. It is a really big investment. It's 300 US dollars, but if you have the money for it, I highly recommend it. If you do have a MacBook and you're not quite ready to invest in it, you can always get a free trial of it and see if you like it and then decide to upgrade. Or you can just use iMovie. I know lots of people who use iMovie and they have 100,000 followers, 100,000 subscribers. So it's not necessary, but I really enjoy it. So that's why I use it. And some other hardware things that I use, I have a USB-C adapter for my MacBook because it only has two USB-C ports. So I use that so that I can put in my SD card and so that I can attach my SSD, which is a solid state hard drive. And it is an external hard drive. I use that whenever I am editing my videos so that I can save the space on my computer. And that way I can travel with it if I ever need to edit on a different computer. It just makes it so that I always have it with me. And it makes it so that my videos are kind of in set places. So in case something were to happen to my computer, nothing happens to my videos. So now we're getting into the actual editing, which is something I've actually not talked about a ton on this video. I mean, on this channel, I have made some videos where I'm editing in the background or I kind of give like a very brief walkthrough of how I edit. But for the most part, I've kind of just done some like really quick videos, time lapses. But now I'm gonna kind of give you a more in-depth tutorial. It's not really a tutorial, more in-depth of how I edit just because I haven't talked about it before. So the first thing I do is import the footage onto my computer. I use my adapter, plug it into the computer, and then I create a new folder on my desktop titled whatever the video is. And then I drag the stuff from my SD card onto my computer. And sometimes it takes a long time because the clips are pretty big, but putting them in the folder makes them easier to find and they're already separated. So I don't have to worry if I filmed multiple videos on one card and I'm importing them all at the same time. After that, I open Final Cut Pro and I create a new library and a new project. I do a new library for every video because I have run into the case where the library is like 400 gigabytes and then the SD card, I mean the SSD fills up and then I kind of just have to work around stuff to figure out how to finish editing. It takes longer and it's just overall more frustrating. So I just make every video a new, its own Final Cut library so that way I can delete old ones once I'm finished with them and so I don't have to delete project files that I'm not done with yet, if that makes sense. Then after that, I drag all of the videos, all of the clips into the timeline that I'm working with. That's pretty simple. It doesn't take that long. I make sure they're in order before I drag them and then just drag them. That's it. Super simple. After that, I add a custom LUT effect. Basically, it is adding a filter to your videos. You can buy LUTs. I'm not, I can't remember what LUT stands for. I'll put it on the screen. I'll look it up while I'm editing, but you can use custom LUTs and you can add coloring to your videos. I just overall think it looks better. Here, I'll show you a clip of what it looks like with it and without it. The whole video is edited with it. The LUT kind of just makes coloring look a little bit better in my opinion. So I do that. I drag it onto every single clip before I do anything else because they're whole big chunks. And once you start cutting stuff, you have to add it to individual tiny little clips and it just takes longer. So I just do it all at one time right at the beginning. Also, I cannot help you make it a LUT. I literally don't know how, I couldn't tell you how I made mine. Basically, I turned one of my Instagram, not Instagram, I turned one of my Lightroom presets into a LUT and that's about as good as it gets. I found a YouTube video. I don't know where that video is anymore. If I can find the link, I'll put it in the description box, but I can't guarantee that I'll be able to find it, but it was really helpful for me. The next step is the rough cut, which is what takes the longest in any process of me making a YouTube video from planning to filming to the rest of the editing. Literally rough cut is the longest thing for me and it's probably what's longest for most people. Rough cutting means that 
you basically are just cutting out everything that you don't need and then you go back to refine it. So for me personally, I wrote it down so that I could <laughs> articulate it better. I edit mostly from sound waves and I cut out the places where there is no sound. So if you look at a sound wave, when you're talking, it goes like this, but when you're not talking, silence. And I do pay attention to the video part while I'm looking at the sound waves to make sure that I didn't pause on purpose for like a dramatic pause or something, but I mostly edit on the sound waves. Then I go back and look at everything I like. I will go through and I'll just like cut. I'll use the blade tool and cut, 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 cut for large chunks and then I'll go back and delete all of those at one time. I find that it's faster for me to do that because it would take so long if I just did it every little individual clip. And then after that, I go through, listen to the section to make sure that it sounds good, that it flows well, that I don't have any ums, buts, so's, awkward pauses or weird breaths because sometimes they're really loud. Like if I'm just catching my breath, sometimes they're really loud. So I cut those out because they're kind of awkward. After I rough cut, I get to do the most fun part is just putting final touches on things, adding overlay and transitions, sound effects, music, text, and all that fun stuff. I also do this, like I said, I also, I do this in order. So I just start from the beginning, I add my intro, then I add my welcome and things like that. And then as I'm going through, I add in the transition and I just do it in order of the video and just make sure that it flows well together before I move on to the next part. Sometimes also whenever I am rough cutting, if a part of a word like gets really quiet, it's hard to see it on the sound wave. So sometimes I do end up cutting that out. So I also just go through and listen to make sure that I didn't cut any words off like in the middle of a word or to make sure that I finished the whole sentence and then I didn't just cut the whole word off. So now that I have talked about all of that with the editing, I did want to give you guys some of my favorite sound effects, transitions, effects, other things in Final Cut that I use and some music examples that I like to use. So first is sound effects. I will play them as I tell you what they are. So the one I use, the three that I mo use the most often are bottle cork, computer mouse, and swish one. In Final Cut Pro, there are two swishes. There's swish one and swish two. I prefer swish one. Swish one kind of goes, it's like, I don't know how to explain it. It's a deeper one. The pitch is lower. If that makes sense, you would have to listen to them both to know. I'll, I'll put them both on here so you can listen. But I use a bottle cork when overlays pop up on the screen. I use computer mouse for pop up on the screen and also for transitions. And then I just use swish for transitions. And now for transitions, the ones that I use the most are static, which is the one that looks like it. Then I use a slide. It's literally just called slide. Final Cut has several different transitions that have the word slide in them, but this one is the one that's just called slide. I think I have mascara on my face this whole video. It's embarrassing. And then lastly for transitions, I use Bad TV and I mostly use this one for text or for cool montages. This one is actually a video effect, but I use it as a transition. Basically, if you have your clip, I cut off a little bit at the beginning and a little bit at the end and apply the effect to the beginning and end and it kind of creates a cool transition effect. And then for effects, I use Bad TV, Frame, and Keir. Bad TV and Frame, I use mostly for overlays and montages. I don't typically, would I wouldn't use them where I'm just sitting here like this, and I wouldn't use them in basic vlog clips where I'm talking. And then Keir is just the green screen. Keir stands for Chroma Keir, which means you are keying out color that's on the screen. So most commonly it's green screen, but sometimes you see it as blue or another really brightly less commonly used color in graphics, if that makes sense. You probably didn't need to know all that, but I felt like telling you anyway. And then of course the other thing that I use in Final Cut that is not in effects or transitions or that most people use is custom LUT which I talked about at the beginning of my editing process. Like I said there are a ton of built-in ones but you can also add in your own as well. Next is music and this is not built into Final Cut Pro. You have to download music and you have to use copyright free music so I get a majority of my music from hellothematic.com. Attribution is required for each song that you use but if you forget to put it in your video they'll literally email you to tell you to do it and they provide the link so it's super easy it's hard to forget especially because they remind you so I really like that so I wanted to share some of my faves on there so I'm just gonna play them for you now there is yours tonight West wait for you think of me sunshine boulevard speckle rise up saltines and ginger ale and there are a couple of songs that I really love from the artist Ryan Little so and then I will occasionally get some songs from soundstripe.com that is a paid subscription website and you do also have to create a license for each song that you download but I don't use it that often and my husband has a subscription to it which is the only reason why I have access to it otherwise I would never even know about it but if I were if I personally were to pay like if I were to make the decision to pay for a music subscription for videos I would use Hello Thematic however Thematic is free there are a lot of premium songs but there are also a huge selection of good songs just from Thematic that I don't really think that paying for it's worth it unless there's just a song that you like are really into if that makes sense but personally I think that 
that Thematic is a really good one, and I know some that other people use is Epidemic Sound, but you have to pay for that, so I stick to Thematic. <laughs> some other things I wanted to share about my editing process are some fonts that I use. I use the font Little Dreamer in my thumbnails. I also use it on my channel banner and other channel art, like the little watermark in the bottom corner of the video and on the end slate on my video as well. Um, I paid for that one from supernicestuff.com, but you don't have to pay for all your fonts, but I did pay for that one. And then I also use Magnolia, which is also paid, also from Super Nice Stuff. I use this one on channel artwork and thumbnails, and it is the font that I use in my intro as well. I use it on thumbnails whenever I add extra text that's like not the main stuff, so usually just for like script and things like that. And then three other fonts that I use pretty regularly are Made Sunflower and Afterglow. Those are both bold serif fonts that are free from defont.com. And lastly is Helvetica. I use all variations and it usually comes on your computer. I don't even think it's on Defont. I'm pretty sure it just comes on your computer. Um, my perfect, my preference is Helvetica Italics Thin or Helvetica New. Also, it's a different variation of it. There's not a huge difference, but there's more variations of it, if that makes sense. Next is Overlays and I make those in Procreate and on Canva. I'm not going to give you a tutorial on that just because there is a lot that goes into it. It's really easy and it's kind of very easy to self-teach that section, but if you're interested in me making a video about how I do it, I can make a separate video on that, but I feel like it's going to just take too long and make this video like really, really long. Next is my thumbnails, and I do have a video on my channel about this, so I'm not going to go too in-depth here, but I will link that video down below for you. First, I get my photos from either screenshotting something in a video. I will pose for the thumbnail, so say I pot pose now. I would screenshot that on my computer and do it that way, or I'll take pictures on my phone and add them to my iPad. I make all my thumbnails on my iPad and I use three different apps. I use Lightroom to edit, I use Collageable to make collages if there are multiple photos, and I use Procreate for text overlays and drawings. The last topic that we're going to be talking about is uploading. When you upload, there are a couple things you have to do. So first you have to include a title. I try to think of something that I think is interesting. So for example, this video is going to be how I make a YouTube video from start to finish, all the steps I take to make a YouTube video or something like that. I feel like it's long enough and I feel like it takes up all 100 characters that you have available. I also try to make it a more searchable topic. So if it's not necessarily pertaining to just me, how to make a YouTube video from start to finish instead of how I make my videos from start to finish. How to is going to be more searchable than how I make my YouTube videos, if that makes sense. In the description box, some things that are important that you don't necessarily have to have, but things that I feel like are important and also things that I do. So first, of course, you want to add your music attributions make sure you don't forget those. And in my description box, I have chapters. I basically, when I'm editing, I take note of different transitions in the video. So for example, this video is going to have several different chapters. I'll take note of whenever I started talking about uploads, and then I'll just put that all in the description box so there are chapters. So that way you can skip around to different parts of the video based on the topic, and it might keep you engaged for a little bit longer. And also I think it's good for SEO because it includes more words into the data. Some other things that I do are add any relevant links. So if I have my camera, I will link my camera. If you want to know where my shirt's from, I can link that if I know where it's from. I don't know where it's from. I thrifted it. But if I'm talking about something or doing a haul, then I'll include links to stuff that I purchased. Or if I do a favorites video, I'll include links. So relevant links are important. If you have affiliate links, even better. Just make sure that you let people know that they are affiliate links so that they know you're making money from it. In fact, I have something in my description box that says if it has an asterisk next to it, then it is an affiliate link and I will earn a commission from the purchase. I also have upload defaults on my channel for my description box. It includes a space for my social media links, any affiliate links that I just keep in my description box already, any other relevant information. I introduce myself in my description box. I have my email address for contacting if you're a brand and want to work with me just so that people can find it really easily. I have everywhere on my channel so there's no question if somebody wants to work with me my email is there. It makes it super easy and also I have a sub count down at the bottom and that's for me so that I just have a good idea of where I was at subscribers when I uploaded that video, just for documentation purposes for me. And then while you're still on that same page, you can click on more info and you can add in all of your tags. Um, I used to do a lot of tags. I was really heavy on the tags, but I'm not so much anymore. Kind of just add a couple of relevant keywords and move on. If you are monetized, then you have the option to click next and go to monetization. So from there, it will allow you to choose what kind of ads you want to put on a video and it'll let you choose whether you want pre-roll ads, mid-roll ads, and post roll ads. So beginning, middle, end. I think the first one is required if monetization is on, but the other two you can turn off. So for the mid
mid-roll ads, I try not to. I do the default ones because sometimes YouTube adds in like way more than I want. They'll add like four in a video, which I personally find really annoying. So I go in and I go back to the timestamp. I usually choose the end of a chapter that I created and put an ad there. So that way it's not cutting me off in the middle of a sentence. I have finished that particular topic and then it just makes more sense. It flows a little bit easier. It's kind of like when you're watching TV, they don't just put a commercial in the middle of the show that you're watching. There's like a natural break within the show, if that makes sense. Then the next screen is if you have monetization, next you just go through and there's a thing. If you have monetization, you know what it is. Um, if you don't, it doesn't matter. Um, and then elements, you add an in screen. I always add an in screen. I import from a previous video so that I can have the same in screen on every single video. It's the same length. It has all the same links on it. And it just kind of has the nice layout that I created that I actually put in at the end of my video. And then for cards, I put in my last top five, my last five videos, or if there is a section that I'm talking about something specific, then I will include the link to what I'm talking about or to other rele relevant videos. So for example, for what I read in September, I will put what I read in August, what I read in July, what I read in June, what I, whatever, so that it has more book related videos. And then depending on the day, the last step that I do is either schedule it or make it go live. If I am finishing up a video on the day that it's supposed to go live around the time that I typically upload, I upload on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, but sometimes I am taking too long to edit or I didn't quite finish something before that time. So if it's after the time that I regularly upload, then I'll go ahead and make it live then, but I typically do schedule my videos because I am a busy gal. Not really, but I try to get them done ahead of time so that I don't have to worry about it the day of. And I schedule it for the next Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I like to do that just so that it's easier. You guys know when a video is coming. It helps keep me on a schedule. And I know when each video is being uploaded because I have a planner with all my videos in it. So with that being said, that was the last thing on this list. I've been talking for half an hour now and I could probably go on about this forever, but I did make it more concise by having a note on my phone. So I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Also, don't be sure, also be sure to check out the channels of the other girls that I'm collaborating with and check out all of their videos that they're posting on this topic if you're interested. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye. We had a good time from what I remember.